Hello, hello. <clears throat> I'm Ali Santana, and I'm part of the Santana Project. We're here. Uh, we have some other members who will be joining us. And uh, we are an interdisciplinary, intergenerational uh, family of artists living and working in Brooklyn, New York. And um, tonight, we're just going to show some of our work and have a conversation about creativity, survival, um, collaboration, and uh, I'm gonna start with uh, my dad here. This is Al Santana. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, my name is Al Santana. I'm an independent filmmaker, uh, basically. Uh, I do a little bit of music from time to time. Uh, I play bass, I play uh, congas, drums. Been doing that for years. Uh, I also am a still photographer um, and a newly minted uh, abstract painter. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just go directly to uh, a clip of some work that I've done that incorporates uh, some ideas that I was working around um, music, uh, community, and uh, some of my paintings. Okay. Yeah, I, I just uh, want to give some background in case people were wondering what <laughs> what that was that just played. Um, it's a uh, part of a longer piece that I, I produced independently. I'm an independent documentary filmmaker, basically. <clears throat> I've been doing it probably for 40 odd years, 45 years. Uh, got my start uh, right out of uh, college in 1972 uh, when I went my, made my first uh, trip to uh, West Africa. And I saw some things I didn't understand when I was there. And I came back and did some research around some spiritual practices. And I decided that I was going to make a thesis film dealing with African traditional religions in America. And I did a short film called Gods in Exile. Uh, so uh, that's sort of the 
the genesis of my work. It's the beginning, you know, of my work dealing with cultural uh, and political uh, ideas that are, you know, happening in our communities. So um, this piece that we just saw was a, a piece I did a, about a year and a half ago called uh, Dancing in the Streets, uh, A Matter of Life and Death. And I, since I've become a um, abstract painter recently in the last year, I decided to incorporate some of the uh, paintings that I've been making and posting online uh, into this piece. So um, the piece sort of deals with the, the, the short, the longer piece, which is 18 minutes, sort of deals with the whole idea of uh, dancing in the street as a call to action. Uh, that's why I incorporated scenes from this uh, uh, political march uh, rally that actually took place uh, following the, uh, the murder of uh, Sean Bell. Um, and it was a, a, major, uh, a major demonstration. And as you can see, many people turned out. Um, so I'm sort of dealing with this sort of confluence of uh, uh, dancing in the street and as a, as a political uh, metaphor, as you if you will, that sort of looks at the whole idea of people in the community coming together uh, and dancing. Now, the, the original dancing in the street was Martha and the Vandellas, um, and that was out of, out of Motown. And, uh, you know, I grew up in the 60s, late 50s, 60s, and uh, we saw that as uh, one, uh, an entertainment, but also as a call to action, you know, and we saw it as a political uh, uh, song, and uh, and it was it was moving. So I decided to incorporate that sort of idea into this into this project, and so that's what I've been trying to do uh, with a lot of my my new work. Um, I can go back a little bit. I started out as an experimental filmmaker in 1972, and uh, and it was interesting at the time because it dealt with a lot of uh, abstract structures and ideas and sounds and uh, and it was is very interesting. It's sort of a visceral visceral aspect of of the filmmaking process, dealing with the editorial time and and uh, dealing with time and as a, as a construct and moving images and um, so. Uh, but one of the things that one of the drawbacks to that was. Uh, it didn't have a social or political context. And me growing up in that period of time, I just felt that it was missing some things. So um, what happened is uh, once I graduated, um, I started uh, you know, looking for work. And so I got jobs as a, um, a cameraman, as a cinematographer working in public television. And uh, uh, the whole idea of the abstraction got sort of pushed aside and we became, I became more uh, structured in terms of that. So, um, you know, the images, the size of the images, the framing, the color, all of that stuff had to conform to uh, certain ideas that were sort of handed down to me as opposed to me being as creative as I could possibly be. So I did that for a number of years, working in television and working in independent film. And so now, at this stage in my life, I'm sort of going, doing a loop going backwards to try to discover some more um, abstractions uh, within my current work. And that's why uh, the idea of being an abstract painter sort of appealed to me. Um, so now I'm basically trying to meld the two together, you know, the abstract painting, the visual, uh, uh, cinematography, the still photography, it's all, it's like one big cauldron at this point. I'm mixing it up and I'm trying to figure out a way to make it all come out. You put all the, everything in the big end of, 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 the, of the, uh, <laughs> the, the funnel and then the other end is all supposed to meld and come out. So that's what I'm attempting to do. And uh, so uh, that's, that's what the experiment is with, with this project. So I'm going to pass this on so I don't take up too much time. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but we're going in age order. So <laughs> we started with Al and I'm Marilyn Nance and I call myself the matriarch of this Santana project. Um, kind of funny to have all of this family. 
um, we didn't start off trying to be a collective. I mean, I think what happens is like, you meet an artist, you have a baby, <laughs> you know, you have kids and, and things happen. Um, so uh, when I met, so I'm gonna start with that. I met Al in 1978 and it was right after I had come back from a major trip. I, had, I was a photographer um, for the uh, FESTAC 77 in North American zone, the US, uh, it was a major pan, <coughs> excuse me, Pan-African Festival of Arts and Culture. And at the time I met Al, he had just come back from Brazil uh, doing a, a film with uh, of Sarah Vaughn. So we had a lot to talk about. My never having been to Brazil at the time, and Al had been to, to Africa, but he hadn't been to Nigeria. So, um, anyway, so should I be showing work at this time? Let's, okay. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't tell what was up. I'll have to look at your. So I'm going to jump around a little bit. I had some ideas about talking about lineage and storytelling. And um, I sort of figured out that we're from a, um, I'm from a, uh, a line of storytellers. And um, I noticed that Ali talks about being a storyteller. Rafia talks about being a storyteller. I think even Al does. So it's, it's interesting how you build family that, um, uh, anyway, the photograph that you may see up there um, is the image taken at the African burial ground. And there were these brothers who were grieving outside there as if they knew um, the people who had passed away. So the African burial ground is a site in New York, lower Manhattan in New York City that was um, um, the site of where African folks were buried in, I think, the colonial days in New York City. And uh, it was built over, and it wasn't until a federal building was being, uh, a site was being excavated for a federal building that that, that was discovered. So there was a, a lot of um, uh, community uh, interest in that site and in the remains of uh, the people who were buried there. Can we go to the next image? Um, I'm gonna skip around a little bit. Ali's going. Uh, this is one of my earlier photographs. It was a, it's a photograph of uh, three, I call it three women. This is the early days of, uh, of when I photographed. Uh, this was at a studio museum in Harlem block party in probably about 1970, two or so, 71 to 72. Next image, please. I think I should go faster, All right? Oh, it's okay? Okay. Nah, that's my grandmother. And what I remembered about my grandmother is that she told s stories. And um, I can't remember what stories she told me, but I, you know, that's, that's my old grandma. Uh, she always got on my case for taking photographs of her when she wasn't ready, when she didn't have her, you know, her wig on, or when she wasn't, you know, but my, my thought was just like, that's my grandmother. And I think a lot of the images I take are really out of a real profound love for the people that I'm photographing. Um, now this photograph, no, it, was it this photograph of my grandmother? No, the, the photograph that, um, that was, sub be shown in Lagos, Nigeria for FESTAC 77 was also an image of my grandmother, wasn't that one? So she was important to me. Next image, please. Uh, I just like that image, um, balloon party. I'm, yeah, I'm just gonna, let, let's just rest. I don't have to talk about each image. It's, it's, you know, I mean, you may have some questions later. So it was really difficult for me. You can go forward as, as you want. It was difficult for me to decide which images to show. So they're sort of jumping around. This is an image of uh, President Senghor of Senegal's, President Senghor's mother's room. And we were, you know, on a tour um, in Senegal in 19, about 1984. Um, I don't know why that, you know, that image kind of, why, why even put that image in there? But there it is, next. Uh, three placards. Uh, this is at an anti-apartheid rally in um, 
in Central Park in New York City in 1986. And the images, the three placards are uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, the far left, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. in the center and Malcolm X at the right. Uh, I don't know what else to say about that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm used to having people ask questions. Interestingly enough, this image was taken on the same day in Central Park, and I was looking at these, you know, this couple, like, oh man, they're so sweet. They're like, and I was thinking, I was processing all these ideas about, like, it's smooching over a barrier. It made me think about a, a life in in South Africa across borders, and I was thinking about police presence, and and so I'm trying to make the police officers think that I'm not photographing them, and I'm trying to make the couple think that I'm not photographing them, but indeed I wanted that uh, relationship between the two um, bodies of people within the same frame. Um, so when you're making an image, it's really about um, making a story happen within a particular frame. Community baptism, and that was also, 1986 was a big year for me. I think that's when I first started calling myself a photojournalist. And what was interesting about 1986 was that, well, when I first started photographing, I, I couldn't figure out how I was gonna be a photographer and a mother. I mean, not when I first started photographing. I first started photographing when I was about 18, so I've been photographing all of my adult life and in 1981, when I became Ali's mother, what, what's that on the screen? <laughs> well, that's a, when I became Ali's mother, I, I couldn't figure out how I was gonna be a photographer and a parent at the same time. So a lot of the images that you may see here were made when, you know, with my children around. I know in this photograph that's up, Ali was in the frame somewhere. As a matter of fact, I see Al there. Um, the, yeah, I have a lot of, uh, most of the images are people that I know or I've gotten to know. So when people ask me, what do you photograph? I always say, me, because this is the life of a mid-century to end of, you know, century, turn of century African-American woman. Next. I think we could probably go faster. Um, day of Outrage. There were so many days of outrage. This one was uh, when this, the subways, and I think that was maybe 1987, when the subways were stopped. Next image. I should have. I'm just gonna keep going because I don't, I'm, you know. I was working with a, a writer, Peggy Dye, who had an interest in all things Malcolm X, and uh, I was photographing inside of a, a classroom, and I'm, not, I'm sorry, I was photographing inside of an auditorium, and it, not much was going on visually, but when I got up uh, and walked through the halls, I saw this, um, today is Thursday, this is a special day, it's the birthday of Malcolm X. Um, Malcolm X was shot and killed, and this school, will have a special program. So what do you tell a first grade class about Malcolm X? You know, so that was of interest to me. Next image, please. I'm giving Ali a run for its money. It looks like a lot of images. This is also um, about Malcolm X. This is inside of the Audubon Ballroom. Now, after Malcolm X was assassinated, there was an event that happened that later that evening in the Audubon Ballrooms and the f deterioration that you see here was just after years of decay, years of, of, of abandonment of that ballroom space. The photographs that I made of the Audubon Ballroom were published in the Village Voice with the article by Peggy Dye, and it started the movement to save the Audubon Ballroom, which was slated to become a biotech lab, which I think it is now. But so the. Uh, also, outside of the Audubon Ballroom, there was a rally. Now, I think I included this image because I know that when I made this image, 
Ali was with me, and I know when I made this image, I was pregnant with Rafia, so I'm like always had the, like how do you integrate like photojournalism with, you know, with uh, family life? That's always been an, an issue for me. Next. And my children are really great, um, you know, image finders. They point out, they're like, you know, my seeing eye children. This image is in the um, African burial ground. And I, would, I brought the kids there too. That was around 1992. You don't remember? You would have been too. You, you remember? Oh, no, you wouldn't remember. Um, let's go into the next image. We just, I'm trying to like hurry up and get to the end. This is an image that, um, that I collaborated um, with. It's the image of the artist Charles Searles. And I had this idea that I was going to do flashcards of Festac 77 artists because the, some of the baddest black artists from the United States went to Lagos, Nigeria to be part of this big um, Pan-African Festival of Arts and Culture, but we don't know their names. So my idea was to have an image of the artists with the background of their work and on the back of the flashcard have some, um, some uh, biographical information. So Rafia did the background for him. Rafia did all of the work there and in incorporating my, um, my image. So I've, I've collaborated with Al, I've collaborated with, with uh, Ali, I've collaborated with Rafia. I have yet to collaborate with Steph or, or Allende. So they, they would be the newer members of, the collaborate, of, the, uh, of our group. Next. I'm trying to like get to the end, Malcolm X. Let, let, let's go a little fast, because I want to get to the talk. There's another image that I did in collaboration with Rafia. This is Jeff Donaldson, who's uh, sort of like the head of the North American contingent of Festac 77, and um, one of the artists from Afrocobra, the Arts Collective. Uh, this is a collab, part of a screenshot of a collaboration I did with Ali. Um, Ali what, 14 years ago, did a, did a video with spec book. I can't believe it was, wow. <laughs> anyway, you're trying to like get off of that image real quick. <laughs> this, uh, uh, this is, a, um, I'm a technologist as well, and when I was a student at the Interactive Telecommunications Program, this was like the early web. Um, I did a, uh, made a website called Soul Sister, uh, it's, it's been on the web since like 1995, and right, this is Rafia's world. She was like in first grade or kindergarten, so everybody in my family had like a spot on this website. And so these are drawings made by Rafia when she was in kindergarten or first, something like early um, in elementary school. Rafia again. Um. <laughs> Would you? <laughs> <laughs> Time's up? Well, okay, um, you can go quickly, yeah. Voices of the Gods, a film collaboration with uh, Al Santana. That was the first time we collaborated, I think, and probably the last. Uh, oh, no, 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 right, I'm sorry. No, we work, yeah, we collaborated on um, the piece that's on the wall there, right? Okay, is that the end? Okay. All right, the next person. So I think, yeah, age order, I'm next. Um, I'm Ali Santana and I am a multidisciplinary artist and educator. And um, I primarily work with uh, like time-based media um, and performance. And so I've been experimenting with uh, kind of taking video production, which video production and animation and bringing that into a performance space. And uh, I really find that performance allows me to express myself and, and improv in a, in a way that uh, traditional video production didn't allow me to do. Um, so also I'm a, I'm a current resident at Culture Hub uh, where I'm working on uh, bringing interactivity into that performance. So when I've performed before, I've performed in front of an audience that just kind of sat there and uh, 
watch the performance, but I always wondered what it would be like if that audience had the ability to interact and contribute to the performance as well. Um, so uh, I'm a part of the Santana Project, of course, but I'm also uh, a member of a uh, audiovisual art collective called uh, Brooklyn Zulu. And we are a bunch of friends, well, three of us, we're a few friends who uh, we just hang out and uh, kind of experiment with technology and be creative. And uh, we would make these weird audio visual kind of creations and decided that we should just probably give it a name and perform it for other people. Uh, so this is, that's the logo that we created. Um, and uh, when we first started performing, we were uh, kind of super nervous um, and a little, a little uh, had some stage fright. So we would perform in costume and we would create these costumes basically made up of uh, scraps uh, of clothing that didn't fit anymore. We'd fashion it into like these kind of masquerade uh, uh, costumes. And uh, this was like really a way of, of expressing ourselves. Uh, so this is kind of like an album cover that uh, was shot by a photographer, Phyllis Galimbo. And uh, I do have a clip of uh, one of our performances at Culture Hub as part of the uh, Indeterminate Forms program from 2018. And so in this clip, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about it before I play it. Uh, it's, it's a three-man group, and one of us would be controlling visuals, another one controlling audio, another one on effects, and then have some kind of uh, uh, live sound through a microphone on as well. So this, this particular clip is a, uh, it's like a meditation on uh, police brutality and our way of expressing our anger and frustration with uh, the things that were going on uh, in, this, in this piece called Say When. Started. The state attorney general's office says they are investigating the case, a slight glimmer of hope for a community that's long been fed up. We need to be held accountable because too many of our people are being killed and we need answers. Yeah, um, and so that was kind of the beginning of uh, the live performance work. And uh, eventually I just wanted to kind of continue to create and tell more personal stories. Um, and I started to really experiment with kind of like trying to do all of this stuff at once at the same time. Um, and had a show uh, at Roulette, which is a venue in Brooklyn dedicated to experimental performance as part of the Mixology Festival where I debuted this uh, show that I called Boom Bap Cinema. And Boom Bap Cinema was just a name that I came up with uh, to describe my process of, of uh, making this, uh, this live audio and video compositions in front of an audience. Uh, that includes a lot of improvisation. So I'd start with like a library of audio and a library of video and was really interested in being able to edit that stuff live. Um, and so part of my practice also is I create music beats that I never release, um, but it's just become uh, a way for me to express myself, almost like a diary. So I'll try to make something every day, kind of name it with a date, and then I can look back on it and be like, oh, I was feeling kind of angry that day, or, you know, uh, you know, I was feeling, I was in a good mood this day. So I would play these beats back and add effects and things with uh, different video clips, and here's a clip of that performance.
And so, uh, Bumbaye is my is my stage name. Um, people sometimes ask me, you know, what does that mean? And it's kind of a, an homage to uh, <laughs> to to Muhammad Ali. Um, and all when I was a kid, my family members, my aunt in particular, used to call me. Used to say Ali Bumbaye whenever I did something. If I had a, a show or if I graduated, she would make that chant. And that kind of that means Ali kill him. Um, so when I, when Muhammad Ali was was uh, what, what fight was that? When he was fighting George, George Foreman? Um, in what country was he in? Zaire. He was in Zaire. And so when he would get off the plane or when he would get when be in a crowd and audience, everybody in the street would come and say, Ali, boom, bye, yay. And that was just all of his supporters and people uh, like kind of cheering him on to, uh, to, to win. And so for me, that's, that's been a way for me to kind of like cheer myself on, but like also like if I'm gonna do something, I wanna kill it. I wanna do it well. Um, and so I've been releasing or making music and performing under that name as well. Um, I also mentioned that uh, I was a, uh, that I'm an educator. Um, I teach mostly in the museum settings, um, working with teenagers and uh, at the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, there I just kind of share my practice with young adults and uh, teach them how to express themselves creatively through audiovisual art. And uh, last year, um, I won an award from the uh, Association of Teaching Artists for Innovation in Teaching Artistry. So that was kind of, that was really fun to, to know that I'm kind of, you know, on the right track, I guess, <laughs> um, coming up with these crazy classes. But I just wanted to show you a clip of some of my student work from a summer class, um, because I'm really proud of them. Uh, we did a we did a class called Altered Egos, which was um, a class about like masquerade and and costume making, where the, the students were tasked with coming up with an alter ego, and we sourced materials from like the Salvation Army and Goodwill and cardboard off the street and anything else we could find, um, and then we made these costumes and these characters, which we then uh, dressed up as, filmed them in front of a green screen. Uh, created some abstract audio and some abstract uh, video to go behind it. So this is uh, a little promo that we made for the for the class for their final project. Yeah. So. Um, and I'm like, what else should I show? I got a whole bunch of stuff, but I want to pass the mic. Um, so I'm also a collage artist. I love to collage stuff. Uh, these are just a few examples of my collage collages. A lot of them are still from video. Um, I'm really in, into the into abstract into abstractions and and uh, kind of experimental art um, and expressing myself through there, but also expressing emotions and and uh, and, and feelings and, and, and basically trying to interpret the world and different issues through uh, abstraction. So I'm particularly interested right now in glitch art and um, like data moshing and just anything that where you can get messy and just really express yourself. For such a long time, I worked in uh, graphic design and motion graphics and there was such a, an emphasis on being clean and, and aligning to the grid and all this stuff. And this is just kind of me like acting out um, at this point and, and separating from that. And uh, I, think, I think that's all I'm gonna show for now. Um, so I'm gonna pass the mic to the, Rafia? Hi, so um, my name is Stephanie Santana and um, I'm primarily a textile artist, um, designer, and um, when Marilyn and Al were talking about how they met, I just thought about another way that technology plays into our collective. <laughs> so Ali and I met on MySpace back in 2005. <laughs> so I was like, that's, that's part of how I became part of this family and this collective, and I mean, there's our collaboration, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I guess I could show a couple images. Real quickly. Oh, is it? It's already up. Okay, so I just in thinking about my practice in textile art, 
I come from, I would say, like a, a lineage of, you know, you talked about storytellers a lot, um, educators and folks who are really into preserving history and understanding history. So I recently went to um, Seattle, actually, where this is where I grew up, and um, I was looking for, I mean, I was, I was going back to visit family, but um, my, my Aunt Bootsy, she was sort of like the matriarch in our family um, on my mom's side. She was my, my mother's aunt, my grandfather's sister. And um, she, she recently passed, and so we, we had a funeral service for her. And after that, we all went back um, to her home and were looking through all these photo albums. And I realized <clears throat> how much of like a natural archivist she was, which seems to be the case in my family. Like she and her husband had collected, you know, albums and albums worth of photos throughout her whole life. She lived to be 94 years old. So she had albums going back to the 1940s all the way up through, I think maybe the early 2000s when I guess she couldn't keep that up anymore. Um, so that was just amazing to see that she found all these things that were worth documenting um, within just like our day-to-day -day experiences. And she, um, yeah, she meant a lot to us. And I decided like, you know, as part of my practice, just looking through old photographs and wanting to really preserve that history um, that I wanted to kind of take those those photographs and take those images and, and expand them and kind of like work with them, add color, like see, you know, how I could kind of make a textile piece that honors um, my family history and particularly like the women in my family, just because, you know, they're dope <laughs> and I wanted to, to remember them. So this is, this is a piece that I've made um, and I have it right here actually because it's in progress, but <laughs> she's going wild with the Sharpie. Um, yeah, so this just kind of shows the process. I think, Ali, can you go back to the original image? I don't know, it's in there somewhere. Yeah, the photo. So that's the original image. So this is her. She's on the left. Um, her full name was Mildred McHenry, Mildred Katrina McHenry, also known as Millie, but we called her Aunt Bootsy. And that's her. Um, and I guess some friends, I don't really know the context other than that, but this, you know, she was in the Seattle area. Um, and she moved there, I think, in the 1940s to be with family. Um, she was originally from Texas, um, from Terrell, Texas. And my, my mother grew up in Dallas, so Terrell was like a small town. Who actually, it's kind of random, but Jamie Foxx was from there too, who was known as Eric Bishop back then. Um, so it was just a very small town, which I visited um, about 10 years ago. And she, yeah, this is, this is just her. And I took that image and I said, okay, I'm gonna make it, you know, half tone it and make it something that can be screen printed because as a textile designer, I learned how to, to screen print. Um, and so can you move on to the next? Yeah, so I, I just kind of played around with different colors and cut it up. Um, and then you could go to the next one. Yeah, so that was just me starting to lay it out and figure out uh, how to place it. And then um, basically where I am now with it, I don't know if you can really see, but I've started to quilt, um, which is something I really became interested in because there's such a long tradition of um, black women quilt makers, such as you know Jeeves Bend and um, Faith Ringgold and her story quilts. So I really um, look up to and admire those, you know, that tradition of quilt making and wanted to kind of play around with it and um, bring sort of like a different element to it. And I also have a couple. Ooh. This is another photograph that I started to work with and I think I'm gonna dye it and then, um, work with that. So this is, this is Aunt Bootsy, and this is my mother right here, and that's my Aunt Janet. So they were just, I guess, at her home and, you know, talking on the couch. And um, yeah, I mean, these, these are things that are really special to me. Um, another thing I was also thinking about, too, in making these and how technology plays into it is that oftentimes um, 
the the main way that I communicate with my family because we live in different places. Like my my parents are in the Seattle area, my sister's there, my brother's in Switzerland. So we're just all in the group chat. And a lot of times, you know, when they're at home or they've, you know, gone through different photo albums, they'll like take a shot of it and send it to us and be like, oh, look at this photo of, you know, mom back in 1982 or something. So I'm like, you know, how can I preserve those images if it's just, you know, a lot of times we take pictures on our phone nowadays and they don't go anywhere. They just, you know, we're not printing them out in the albums. Um, <laughs> and they, um, so, yeah, this is, that's basically where I'm, where I'm at with my practice. I don't know if there's anything else. Okay, I can hand it over to Rafia. Oh, yeah. oh cool. Um, I don't know what, I don't know if it's on. I'm Rafia. Uh, I went to the wrong building first. Oh, there I am. Um, I'm a multidisciplinary artist. Uh, born in this family, picked up something. Um, I can't. What, what's up there? I can't see what you what you're showing. Okay, cool. Yeah, that would be helpful. Just because I don't know what's on this. Oh, I can kind of see it on that monitor down there. Um, so this was actually part of a different image, which I didn't send you. Um, but this is a badge that I made from. Looking at this brand called Wave Enforcer, actually, um, which is a black hair care product brand. Um, and I was making these like black face images at the time of white celebrities who uh, use black culture and black imagery in their branding. And this particular image was from an image of uh, Justin Bieber. and I made animated gifs of him like turning black and I drew a do-rag on him. But anyway, that was at the like the bottom corner of that. And I started using this badge on other uh, images and I just kind of liked the way it looked on its own um, as opposed to just being a design element of a different image. So now I make stickers and I make buttons out of those um, and I sell those as merch. It's pretty cool. Um, what's next? Ooh. Um, so just this past April of 2019, I partook. I was part of the uh, Times Square Arts Midnight Moment, which is allegedly the largest and longest running billboard exhibition in the world, which I didn't know um, until they told me. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and so, yeah, they told me to send some work and I sent this uh, digital painting. This is a selfie that I took probably with my phone and I made a digital painting of it on Photoshop. Um, and I made these like warping uh, like graphics and these sort of disorienting movements behind it and the face you know, rotates and does all this crazy stuff. And this played out every night of April. Um, 2019, but like for three minutes, it was, uh, two, it was a midnight moment, so it was like two minutes and 50 seconds maybe. But on many of the billboards in Times Square, it was super cool. I was really excited about it. Um, the title was Disillusions, and then at the time they had just built that, uh, Ma, don't finish, I know what I'm saying. Um, they had just finished building these billboards like in the middle, um, like right under the, the New Year's Eve ball. Um, they had just built some, uh, some billboards and the people who own that building or the billboards, I forget how like the legality of it is, but um, they were like, oh, we don't have any art to put on. And, like we don't have any th content to put on these boards that are now on and that we just built. Um, and so Times Square Art said, oh, we have something. So like part of it was up there, part of this animation was up there all day, which I, could not have hoped for any different because I've had friends hitting me up and say, oh, I saw your face in Times Square. Um, so that was pretty cool. What's up next? So here's another um, um, example of the digital painting, digital painting and how I um, animate it. So I, I make a lot of these things in layers just because, you know, just like painting, you go over something, go over it with another set of layers. So oh, you go through it kind of fast. I want to finish talking. Um, no, it's okay. Um, so I do um, often these distor distortions of myself, 
um, and abstractions of my face and my body. Um, this one was called Very Little Sleep. Hey, I'm still talking about it. Um, and I, because at the time I was getting very little sleep. You know, I think it was like just post grad. Um, I don't know, it's hard to get sleep when you're on a business hour time and you're like also an insomniac. Um, so it's these weird Photoshop distortions that's just kind of like a visualization of how I felt. Um, all right, what's next? There's another digital painting. This was a part of my first solo show that was at uh, Mokata in Brooklyn, the museum of, what's the? Contemporary. Contemporary arts of the diaspora, yeah, the Afro diaspora. Um, and it was in the window gallery uh, outside of the building. So I had people who would not have thought to go inside of a gallery, you know, were just passing by it saying, oh, you know, we saw your work. And I, I really was always interested in public art just because I kind of don't like museums and like having to go into a lot of the gallery, just kind of like the cultural, uh, not implications, but kind of just like the, the, the vibe that I get from going into a lot of art spaces. Um, irks me sometimes, but I, I'm really into public art because it's like, it'll expose people who don't engage in art on purpose, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the time. Um, so it was really cool. I would get like friends I'd went to grade school with say, oh, I saw your work. I didn't know you were doing this. You know, I hadn't seen them in years. Um, this was another image from that, um, that same show. Actually, the 100% Black was one of them too. So I This was actually what was showing in, um, I wish the sound was on. Um, there we go. So at the time when I dropped the dissolution um, midnight moment, I also simultaneously dropped an EP that I had been working on of songs because I'm also a musician. I begged my parents for piano lessons when I was five and Eventually, they let me quit at 17. I you know, had a lot going on at 17 years old. Um, but my brother uh, had me take classes for uh, like Ableton Live, which is a digital audio workstation. Um, and I have been making electronic music consistently since 2012. It took me a couple years to learn how to use this program. But anyway. This video is like what was showing in Times Square without the text. It was just my face. Uh, what else do I have in this? I think that's it. Okay. Um. Yeah. Maybe the diorama that you work on recently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, was, what was the diorama about? I already brought it to school. School. school already? Mm -hmm. Can you describe yeah. it? Can you tell us more about it? What animal was the project based on? Mm, a hippo. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us some things about hippo? Like, they eat the grass that they already ate when, when there was no more grass. Mm. Mm. So they, they eat the grass again? Mm -hmm. To preserve, to conserve their food? Yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 what's, what's your favorite thing about hippos? What's your favorite thing about hippos? I'm not going to say it. You can say it. I'm not. I'm not going to say it. So, how, I know we talked about how technology kind of influences our, our practice. Um, how would you, 
we didn't talk anything about this uh, this piece that we did together, this collaborative piece behind us. Yeah, we have one minute to say it. Um, okay, five more minutes. Uh, so the piece behind us is a lenticular uh, print, um, which means that, I mean, the best way for me to describe it for people is like, if you ever had a, uh, had a box of Cracker Jacks and they had that like little reflective sticker in there that if you turned, you could see things animate. That's what this lenticular print is. And we made it because we, uh, a lot of us are, are image makers and makers of the moving image and we challenged each other, I guess, to make some artwork that did not require electricity, but was able to move and be interactive. Um, so if you move around, if you change your position, you can actually see parts of that image change and animate. Um, and it's a collage based off of photographs from um, that my mom had made in the late 70s during her trip to uh, Nigeria. And um, I don't know what else to say about it. You want to say something? Uh, Fela, we were uh, in, a, in a group show um, about that was at the Caribbean Cultural Center, CCADI, and the entire show was about Fela. So we got together and uh, collaborated on a piece, a story about Fela. And I was in Nigeria in 1977 and left on the 17th of, of, uh, of February 1977. And on February 18th, the soldiers burned um, Fela's uh, shrine down. And so there's a little bit of fire going on in there. There's some military people going on in there. There's Fela dancing. There's, uh, so there's a lot of imagery that's tucked inside of uh, that piece of work. And so we were trying to tell a story about Nigeria. And um, I, I just want to put in a shameless plug. I'm working on a book now called Last Day in Lagos, which should be out in about a year. And it's t photographs taken by, made by me in Lagos in 1977. So this is kind of like Last Day in Lagos kind of <laughs> crystallized into one image. And the image was created by me Ali, uh, Al, and Rafia. So I guess the next thing we'll do will include like all of us. This was before Steph, before Allende. So we keep growing. Yeah, one of the things that I like to say about that piece is that we were sort of, you know, we were invited to this show and we were battling, not battling, but we're discussing going back and forth about how we would present uh, this uh, piece. So we thought about uh, video at some point, um, you know, and then we thought, well, this video is probably, in most shows, get relegated to a corner in the back, and, you know, people have to go back there, and it's, it's, and you can't hear it, and it's, like, quiet. So we said, we don't, we don't want anything like that. So we, we wanted something that we could present that had the motion of video, but at the same time was would stand up to the other uh, static images that were, you know, mainly photographs and paintings that were on the wall. And so we just went back and forth about how to do it. And we had no idea how to really make a lenticular print. We knew kind of what it was, you know, because we grew up with these things coming out of Cracker Jack boxes and whatever we call them uh, holograms at the time. But uh, so we had to do some research and we went around to uh, a couple of shows that actually were uh, taking place in, in Manhattan at the time that featured lenticular prints and we spoke to people about their process and we learned a little thing here and there. And Ali uh, basically uh, you know, designed the piece and, uh, and, and learned a lot about how to uh, manufacture the piece. And uh, it turned out really well. And you know, and Rafia, she did the um, vector art, she, and because this was these were all black and white images, and she had to then do the vector art and create the color and so forth. So it was a very collaborative process, and it was it was enjoyable. 
And uh, in the end, I think it's a pretty fantastic piece because it's interactive in a sense. And we talked about that back in the, in, the, in the early 80s about interactive art, you know, in terms of video and motion pictures and, you know, and how you were able to change the ending of stories and that kind of thing. And so here we are, you know, in, in 2000, what was it, 12 or whatever it was, 13? 2012. 20, 20, 2010, was it? Is that far back? Wow. Okay, time flies. And so, you know, we were here with the same idea how to make interactive art, but on a wall. And so what happens with this piece is as you move, the piece changes. He, the, the fella himself uh, changes direction. His eyes change directions. His face change directions. There's, there's, yeah, when I move, you move kind of thing. Just like that. And, uh, and, and it's, it's pretty fantastic. So it, even to watch... Uh, people come up and, and sort of dance back and forth with the, with the piece. You know, we had it up and people were like moving back and forth and they're watching the image change because there are actually dancers on the, on the piece as well who move and uh, the flames and the, uh, and the fire. Uh, it's like a, a ephemera that you had collected yeah. from, the, from Festac. There are yeah. handwritten uh, letters in the back. There are, like if you look deep, there are many different layers to this. Um, this is only the second time it was ever shown. Right, uh, it's been in our in our studio, um, kind of for private viewing only. But yeah. like, I, it was kind of fun because we were taking just all of these different uh, letters and 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 what it, you had like a image from a magazine that we that you had brought back that we scanned and included in that, and then a stamp and um, the the photo of the shrine of Africa, uh, the Africa shrine, and. Um, what is the, the title? The, the title is Heavy Comprehensive Show. Now, where, where did that come from? So that, that title came from, there was an advertisement for, uh, I think, one of Fela's performances. Mm -hmm. um, and the name of his performance was Heavy Comprehensive Show. So we thought that it would be cool to name right. this piece Heavy Comprehensive Show. So you said there's this uh, Heavy Comprehensive Show tonight at the Shrine. Uh, let's see. Chief Priest says... Uh, I can't even read all this stuff. Basically, this was Fela's, it was an ad that Fela Anikolapu Kuti put in the uh, newspaper in Lagos, Nigeria, saying that we're having a show at the Shrine. I'm not taking part in Festac 77, but you know, come see me, but I'm not coming to be part of this major festival. He had some disagreement with the, um, with the government. So, yeah. So, so there's a lot to it, and we, we wanted to tell a story, um, you know, through this, uh, without, without it being like uh, time-based, where you had to watch it in a linear fast fashion. You could just look at the different elements and kind of gather the story from there. Um, and like I mentioned, there's so many different layers in it. Um, and uh, so we had to, I think there was a company in Canada, I forget the name of the company, that we had produced this, and there was like a whole... Uh, in, uh, instruction book for how to create a lenticular piece because I had never made one before. So it was a learning process. Um, but basically it, it included like extracting video into different frames and uh, moving them across different layers in Photoshop. So I had to use a lot of my knowledge as like a, a designer and a, a motion graphics designer um, to, to, to build this, this piece. And I remember in the end, this thing was like humongous. It was maybe like over 16 gigabytes and uh, so many layers, and I, I was like it was it was a challenge to even upload it. I had to like go to work to MTV and, and upload using their their system. But um, we're really happy with the way that it came together, and I'm looking forward to making more lenticular pieces because I don't know things are crazy. We can't we can't rely on electricity uh, <laughs> for everything. So I want I want something that you know I, I, I want to be able to express myself or have something that I can enjoy without electricity. Um, I think our time is up. Does anybody want to say anything before we? Uh... I think this might be the last time we'll be seen in public for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we're going inside. Yeah, to the bunker, back to the back cave. Well, um, we'll see about that. Yeah, but thank you to everybody um, yeah. who who may have uh, tuned in to the stream. Doesn't um, mean stay home. Now you're talking.